We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. How is everybody doing this morning? Yeah, we got eight days until Christmas, right? We got to be excited about that, right? Yeah, well, a few of you, I guess, are. Maybe you guys relate to Pastor Michael's wrench uh, sweater. Um, so they were all wearing their ugly Christmas sweater things, and so I thought I would participate by doing the opposite, by wearing the beautiful cowboy star. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So... Um, but anyway, just uh, my name is Pastor Mac. I serve as here as one of the pastors, and it's a pleasure. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'd certainly love to meet you afterwards. Um, and so we are going to be finishing our last installment of the book of James today. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, go ahead and take it out, or they have in the seat backs in front of you, they have Bibles. If you don't own one, take that one home with you. Uh, but if you want, switch, flip to James 5. We're going to be in the last section of it, going through 7 through 20 there. Um, and so I think one of the things that we have to understand is that we're kind of in a unique, in a unique place in history right now. Uh, not even just in our own lives, but also in the, in the lives of the church as well. Uh, we live in an era of rapid changes, uh, unprecedented challenges, um, and as well as deep personal trials. And it's at times like this where we really do have to rely on the Word of God. We have to rely on the Scripture that has never changed. And so this morning, we're going to turn our hearts and minds to the book of James. Uh, this is a passage that I believe that resonates profoundly with what any one of us may be going through. And so James, if you haven't picked up on it in the last six weeks, he is characteristically, he is direct, and he is all about practical uh, messages. Uh, he addresses believers like us who face their own set of trials and tribulations. Now, he doesn't offer them, nor does he even offer us, any type of quick fixes. Uh, instead, he provides something more valuable. It's a blueprint for living faith in challenging times. And this blueprint is not just about enduring hardships, but it's about how we can actively cultivate a faith that is vibrant, dynamic, and transformative, even in the midst of life's storms. And so today, we're going to be taking a look at four pivotal actions to living faith in challenging times. We're going to talk about being patient and persevering through trials. We're going to be talking about committing to honesty and integrity in all of our dealings. We're going to be actively engaging in prayer in every circumstance. And we're going to be working towards the restoration and strengthening our fellow believers. And if there's anything that I would love for you to take away from this message today, it's this next quote that I have on the screen here. The things that I just read to you, these are not just mere suggestions. They are the very essence of what it means to live out our faith in a world that is often confusing and painful. We can't just hear the Word of God. The only other thing we can do is to hear and do what God tells us to do through His Scripture. And so as we go through the book of James, don't think of these as just suggestions. It is the very essence of what it means to live out our faith. So pray with me, and then we're going to dive right in and get started, because there's a lot to cover in just 13 verses here. 
So, Father God, we are just so humbled and honored that you even allowed us to come here today to be able to open up your word uh, with that freedom that we have and knowing that your word has not changed, Father. Uh, the words that were written uh, thousands of years ago, Father, are still very much alive and enacted today, Father. And so open up our ears, soften our hearts, Father. Allow us to receive your words today. And we humbly pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first, where we're going to start off is James 5, 7, and 8. And so you notice, if you were here last week, when Pastor Matt was talking about the warning to the rich, it didn't start off with dear brothers and sisters. The reason being is because James, when he was talking about warning to the rich, he was talking to those rich people who were oppressing the poor. And so here, now, he's changing his audience. He's still now talking to the Jewish Christians, the ones who have been oppressed. And so he starts off with, dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains to fall, and the rain to fall, excuse me, rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for a valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. So our first point that we have here today, and your first fill in the blank there, is be patient and persevere through trials. Be patient and persevere through trials. When James is talking about farmers, at that time they would understand exactly what he's talking about. Nowadays, a bunch of us, we are not farmers. A lot of us may not have that understanding of what it takes to farm, to prepare, so you get that harvest. And so when we break it down, farmers understand that their work is seasonal. Um, there is a time to plant, and then there's a time, time to harvest. Between these periods, the farmer must wait, trusting that the seed sown will eventually bear fruit. This waiting is not passive. It's not just sitting there, they've planted, and they're just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. It involves preparation, nurturing, and protection of the crops. And they also have to depend on factors that are outside of their control, like the weather and how God designed the growing process. They do their part, planting, watering, weeding, and then they must trust in these natural processes in the providence of rain and sunshine to bring about that natural growth. So how does that apply to us? Well, it, the same with the farmers. We have to trust in God's timing. Like a farmer who trusts in the seasons, Christians are called to trust in his timing, even when the immediate results are not visible. Believers are encouraged to have faith that God is working in their lives, even in the periods of waiting and uncertainty. Applying patience also requires not passive, but active waiting. Just as a farmer actively tends their crops, waiting on God involves faithfulness. This includes continuous prayer, steadfastness in trials, Believers are encouraged to persistently to keep doing the good works. Christians are called to nurture in their spiritual lives and in the lives of those around them while waiting for God's plan to ultimately unfold. And then we have to recognize that there is a growth process. That God's plan takes time. It's often something that cannot be rushed. And then while we are dependent on God, we are ultimately hoping for that harvest. The same thing that the farmers do. Their whole process results in them hoping that they harvest and reap the rewards of their label. So similarly, we need to look forward to the fulfillment of God's promises, whether it's in this life or to come. In Romans 5, 3, and 4, it's not on the screen, but it says we can rejoice too. When we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confidence of hope 
in salvation. Now, where I think this is so uh, applicable is, so I back in August, or excuse me, April of this year, we did a stay series on mental health. And I got to share with you guys what it was or what I have been dealing with for the last 16 years. And I can look back now, and I can certainly give God praise that this wasn't something that when I deal with depression and anxiety, that this isn't something that he fixed just like that. Because you have to understand where I came from was I am a brand new Christian. I just got saved overseas, came back here, got back with my group of friends, and I fell back into my old ways. And that cost me a lot. Thankfully, my wife, uh, now, but my girlfriend at the time, um, you know, she, that destroyed that relationship because she realized that the man that she was getting to know was just mere words only. I was just hearing stuff, but I wasn't actually doing anything with it. And so I'm thankful that God didn't just snap his fingers and say, you are healed of depression and anxiety because through that growing process, it allowed me to depend on him over and over and over and over again because otherwise he could have granted that prayer of mine saying heal me from this and then where would I have been? I'm 100% certain I wouldn't be right here if that was certainly the case. Like we don't understand why the pain, why we have to go through for as long as we do, but anytime I feel that anxiety, anytime I feel that depression creeping up, I 100% immediately turn back to God because he is the source of my strength to be able to get me through all of this stuff. And so we have to be patient and persevere through the trials. Um, when you read in James 5 through 9, he says, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. And here's the point number two for you guys. Or she, I, not, I apologize, not quite yet. If you don't know the book of Job, it's a fascinating book. Uh, it's about a man who starts off in the first two chapters of God and Satan have a conversation. And God is challenging, uh, excuse me, Satan is challenging God, stating the only reason Job is staying faithful to you with the riches and the blessings that he has in his life is because you're just giving him those things. If you take it away from him, I bet he will curse you. And so God, in whatever, however that looked, granted Satan to be able to do this. And Job endured probably one of the greatest persecutions that I think any one of us, I would, I, I'm cautious to say it, but I don't know if any one of, one of us could relate to Job. He lost all of his cattle, he lost his health, he lost his wealth, and he lost his children in this process. But in the end, because Job endured, God blessed him with double than what he had lost. And so I do believe most of us take life for granted, as if tomorrow was actually promised. Most of us will never know our life expectancy or our children or our loved ones. And we all hope and pray that every one of them are going to have a long and prosperous life. But parents who have children with various sicknesses have to deal with the fact that one day will be their last time with their child. And that's something that I can certainly feel because I have three precious girls and I know for a fact that if they were on that bed, I would be kneeling down beside them, pleading, praying to God over and over and over that I want you to take my life and not their life. And I mention all of this because of all the hardships and challenges that we face from the world as Christians, why do we as Christians make it so much harder on ourselves than it actually needs to be. As James calls it, grumbling with one another. With all of the work that is still to be done, 
there are millions of people in the United States that still do not know Jesus Christ. There are billions worldwide that still don't know Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 9, for look, the judge, who is God, is standing at the door. Now we are not helping ourselves as witnesses to this world when we continue to act like the world with gossiping, with when we refuse to seek reconciliation with one another over non-essential matters, denominational differences. Churches can't get along with other churches because they don't believe in X, Y, and Z. And I'm talking about the non-essentials matters. When Christians, we can't honor or keep our word, we lose all credibility with the world when Christians can't even honor their word to one another. So point number two is, commit to honesty and integrity in all of your dealings. James 5.12 says, but most of all, out of all of the talks about being patient and persevering, he says, but most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no, and you will not sin and be condemned. I like another translation, I think in the NIV, that says just let your yes be yes and your no be no, for anything else is from the evil one. Ephesians 4, 5 says, and I love this, Paul says, stop telling lies. You can't be any more clear than that. To Christians, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Whose body are we a part of? We're a part of Jesus Christ's body. Embodying the truth of Christ in our words and in our actions. Back in 2014, we were on the hunt for a worship pastor. And it got to the point where we weren't going to go with this particular individual. So I made that phone call and I told him that, you know, thank you for blah, blah, blah. Went through that process. And in that same phone call, he was fighting on why he thought he should be the worship pastor here. So in that conversation, I went back to our overseers, our elders. And we interviewed him again and went through the process again and said, you know what? We like this guy, and we want to bring him on board. Sent him an offer letter. He signs the offer letter, sends it back. We announce to the church. We found our worship pastor, and we are excited. I'm sitting in a, an overseer meeting, and this was maybe a week later. I'm sitting in an overseer meeting, and I look at my email, and I just fall flat in my chair. And I remember one of the elders asking, what, the, what is going on? Um, and I said, well... We had a worship pastor. Um, he said yes, he was going to be our guy. Uh, but he said that uh, he had a conversation with another church. The other church, uh, he told the other church that he had already signed an offer letter and was coming to Maryland. And then from there, the other church still pursued him and offered him more than what we were offering. And so in his email, he said, um, once my wife heard what it was that the church was offering, uh, she was no longer interested in moving to Maryland. And I was just floored. Because this verse right here was the first verse that I thought of. And I responded back to him with that verse. Just challenging him of, just it, it, this doesn't make sense on so many levels. But if there's a character issue, I thank you for revealing that to me now. Versus having to find that out later on. So I praise God for that. Embodying the truth of Christ in our words and in our actions. If you think we need to spend, uh, excuse me, but I will say this. If you have to convince somebody, you know, that's how he said there, do not swear by heaven or swear by anything on earth. That's because the Jews at that time had gotten so used to not saying, I swear to God, because they don't want to take that name in vain. So they would swear by other things to helpfully keep them outside of blasphemy. <coughs> But what James is saying is, as Christians, a simple yes or no will do. That's all it really should be with one another, is a simple yes or no. Because if you go back on your word, not only have you ruined your reputation, 
potentially to other Christians, but if there are other non-Christians, that's how they see how Christians interact. And then that will keep them away from coming to Christianity. James 5, 13 through 16 says, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call on the name of the Lord. Excuse me. You should call on the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and, the, and you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. What James is telling us in here is whether you were happy, whether you were sick, whether you have some uh, suffering that you're going through, it doesn't matter what you're going through, you should be in constant connection to God in prayer. Because prayer is a vital link to God. It's not just a ritual, but it's an actual lifeline in both good and bad times. So what are you, sometimes, I know I do this, and maybe you do as well, but there are times when you may be going through something, and who's the first person that you tend to run to? For me, I tend to run to my wife first if there's a problem or issue. And why? Because she's immediate. She's there. She's a source of comfort for me. And there's nothing inherently wrong with going to your spouse or your loved one for help. But realistically, what James is saying is that they should be number two. The first person that you should be going to in any happy, sad, whatever it may be, you should be going to God first. And that is what James is saying. He's teaching us that God has to be our first love, even ahead of our spouse. God desires for us that he would be the deepest relationship that we have in our lives. And our spouse and loved one should be joining us in whatever affliction, whatever trial we may be going through. But he, they should be joining us with God in there and not just going to them solely, alone. And when James uses that word sick in here, that sick can also be translated in Greek as any kind of weakness. So whether it's something physical, whether it's something mental, whether it's something emotional, right? That term is applicable in here. And so where we have to also be careful when reading this section of verses is it says that all will be healed. Well, we know that's not true. That's to imply that anyone who's sick is healed, right, would certainly just live forever, and we know that not to be true. And it also talks about that your sins will be forgiven. It does, you should not misconstrue that to also mean that because you were sick, you've got some sort of sin issue in your life. Because in John 9, 1 through 3, Jesus heals a blind man, saying it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. And so we don't know why some people are healed and others aren't here on earth. But what we should have in place as Christians and as a church, we should have certain ministries in place to be able to come along somebody who is going through X, Y, and Z. And so we announced earlier this year that we have something called a Stevens ministry. And what we're doing is that we are training up individuals to be able to partner with somebody that's going through a trial. And to be able to help them walk through that trial. We're also starting something called a care ministry at this church. And again, that is all about whether going through divorce or illness or some sort of separation. Whatever it may be, that we have people in this church that feel equipped to come alongside the people going through this. Because the last thing, like I felt 16 years ago, that I felt like I was 100% alone going through this. And I know... I mean, the Satan would want you to believe it, but I know that there are others going through what I'm going through right now. But I just, for whatever prideful or embarrassing reasons, I just try to figure it out on my own. And so bottom line is when prayer is offered in faith, that will provide divine encouragement in the midst of any problem that you are going through. 
Somehow or another, I believe that the uh, anointing of oil seems to be lost in the church nowadays. In my entire career here at ACC, which spans just over 13 years, three times have we actually gotten a call of somebody saying, hey, would you get the elders together, the pastors, and anoint with oil and to be able to pray for this healing? And so I definitely think that's something that should be done more. Because if we believe that this word is still alive and active today, then we believe that that practice of anointing with oil is still very much relevant today. And it should be used. When we go down to James 17 through 18, I love the beginning of this verse here. It says, Elijah was human as we are. And I want you to think about that. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. You know who else has this fervent type of prayer that are humans just like us? What about Hannah? If you know Hannah, read Psalm, excuse me, read Samuel 1, 1 Samuel 1. Now Hannah could not have a child, but her husband had another wife who could have children. So she would go to the temple and she would pray earnestly, just God, please give me a child. And she had that type of dedication that not only did she pray for a child, but she also said to God that if you give me a child that I have been longing for, I will raise the child until I am done nursing. And then after I'm done nursing, I will offer my child to the tabernacle where he will be with the Levite priests and he will live for the world or live for the Lord forever. And do you know who that little boy was? Samuel, the prophet Samuel who did mighty great works. You have the early prayer, excuse me, the early church's prayer for Peter's release in Acts 7 to 12, where it says Peter was in prison. And then the early Christian church, the first century church, earnestly prayed for him. And miraculously, an angel freed Peter from jail, a direct answer to the prayers of the believers. What about Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? Facing immediate crucifixion, he is praying to the Father for his will to be done. How many people do we think that we look at to the Bible, like King David, or even Samuel, Moses, Noah, and we'd say, man, I could probably do X, Y, and Z if I were that guy. And I think that's, that's the lie. That's why I love this verse so much, is that Elijah was as human as we are. As Christians, and this is what I don't want you to miss, I don't want you to think because you aren't one of these men that it's somehow easier for them and harder for you. Elijah was as human as we are. All of them are. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. God's work through the men in the Bible is a testament unto how he will work through each and every one of us. Even more, magnif- uh, even more so as we are empowered by the resurrection power of Christ within us. So what does that mean? It means that we are just like any of these other guys in the Bible, that we have that same resurrection power of Christ, but even greater so because we have Christ. They didn't have Christ. And so whatever trial, whatever it is that you may be going through, when you lean on to God and you harness that power of Christ, you will be delivered through it. I am 16 years living testimony of something that I am not 100% through. But I, again, I praise God because the moment I feel like that I am fully healed from it is the moment I will then turn to my human flesh and say, thank you, God, but I think I got this from here. God 100% holds you despite whatever it is that you may be going through so that you keep turning and depending on him 
100% of the time. And that's why I said at the very beginning, these aren't just mere suggestions that Paul, excuse me, that James is teaching us. It is the way we are supposed to live our life. And so here we have, and point four, our final point, is we have to work towards the restoration and the strengthening of your faith community. Because we are not in this alone. We as Christians cannot forget where we came from. Because God will certainly put somebody in your path that is dealing with what you're dealing, but here you are living the righteous life. They may be straying away, and you can't just say, oh, well, best of luck. What James 19 and 20 is saying, 5, 19 and 20, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Galatians 6, 1, 2 puts it this way. Dear brothers and sisters, if, any, if another believer is overcome by, sin, uh, excuse me, overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the love or the law of Christ. We cannot forget where we came from. We cannot all of a sudden have this judgmental heart of, I now have it figured out with God. Apparently, you don't. I'm going to keep going this way while you further separate yourself from God. That is not what Christ is calling us to do. The ripple effect of restoration. Restoring one person can positively impact the entire community, strengthening the collective faith and witness. It's having the mindset of, I will not stop, I will not quit, until God says that my time is done. If you guys, Rick Warren, he's a uh, over at Saddleback Church in California. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, I recommend to read it if you haven't. But in one of the chapters, his father was on uh, his deathbed. And as his father was dying, his father kept mumbling, just one more. Just one more. Just one more. And so Rick asked his father, what does that mean, just one more? He said, I still have to get one more for Christ. I still have to get one more for Christ on his deathbed. His mindset is one more for Christ. And that is exactly why this church exists. This church exists to see people transformed and to release by the love of Jesus. And if you are a Christian, if you partner with this church, this is your vision statement to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. We are all sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. We cannot forget where we came from. It is of eternal importance that if you have somebody that is astray, that you do what you can to bring them back to the Lord. So in conclusion, I want to briefly speak to the men in this room as we come together to reflect on the powerful teachings I believe that are found in this book. And I want to, and I want to directly speak to the heart of our calling as leaders both in our family and in our respective communities. James presents us not with mere suggestions, but with a crucial charge to be a doer of God's word, not just hears. This call is especially pertinent to us as men striving to lead by example in a world that often seems to adrift from these unchanging truths. In the direct and practical style that James has took us through, he lays out a roadmap for a life that it actively embodies faith. From demonstrating patience in the midst of trials to upholding integrity and honesty in all of our dealings, to engaging deeply in prayer, to working tirelessly for the restoration and strengthening 
of our body of believers. Each of these teachings call us to a higher standard of living as we live out our faith. So for all of us, let's be clear. The book of James is more than just an instructional manual, instruction manual for moral living. It is a stirring call to action for each and every one of us. By embracing these teachings, we do more than just better ourselves. We, come, we become this pillar of strength and guidance for those around us. Our actions, steeped in faith and love, can profoundly influence the lives of others, creating ripples of this positive change that extend far beyond our immediate circles. So consider the weight and the internal significance of this book here. Every decision that we make, every word we utter, every act of kindness, and every effort to bring someone back to the path of righteousness, all of those things have an immeasurable impact. They shape not just our own lives, but also of everyone we encounter. So where do we go from here? We like to end every sermon with a three-word prayer called, What Now, God? What, do you, what would you like us to do with this? So I challenge you to embrace this call with a renewed sense of purpose. Let the teachings of James just not resonate in our ears, but be evident in our actions. Let's not just be men and women who don't just talk about faith, but we need to be able to live it out in every facet of our lives. In doing so, we are not merely engaging with just historical text here. We're actively participating in God's ongoing story, a narrative that shapes our present and defines our future. And here are some practical things that I think we can start doing today. The first one is daily devotionals. If this isn't something that you're doing on a daily basis, it's something that you really need to start today. If you don't know where to start, one of the most downloaded apps in the world is the Bible app. It's version, And they have from anything from I'm just starting off as a Christian to theologians to everything in between. And I would recommend that you find a time in the day that works best for you. For my wife, it is the first thing she does when she wakes up, up in the morning. For me, mine may come several hours later. You have to find the time that works for you to be in God's word on a daily basis. If we want to be like the men that we read who failed, but if we want to be like the men that we read about who held on to that faith, who persevered, they knew God's calling for their life. And that was only because they stayed in constant connection with him. Implement a patience project. Find intentional ways to work on your patience. Whether it's uh, somebody that is difficult in your life right now, or whether you know of somebody who has a sickness, or whether it's a personal goal of yours, try not to focus on the immediate result. Trust in God in what it is that he is trying to show you through this. If you find yourself, for whatever reason, not having any of those issues, then I suggest this is the best time of the year to go to Walmart, two registers, massive lines, intentionally put yourself in the back of that line and be patient, all right? And ask God to keep you patient because you will need it. Get into a prayer group. Find people that are your brothers and sisters, your life group, and pray with them and get them to pray for you and find out their prayers outside of that group and pray for them. We have a prayer group that meets every single Wednesday evening here in the cafe. They would be floored if we had to outgrow that cafe space and move into a, a room like this because they knew that many people had that same desire of earnest prayer. Prayer isn't just something you do when you need to. Prayer is a lifestyle. And then the Bring One Back initiative. Bring <coughs> Excuse me. Bring one back initiative. All of us know somebody in our life 
that was with the Lord and it may be straying away. And it's usually a slow thing. It's not all of a sudden they just quit. There are things that they kind of, markers they leave along the way that we kind of, if we paid attention to, we'd see it. But focus on that one person that you know. And an easy way to do it is, Pastor Michael talked about, we have a bunch of Christmas Eve, Eve at ACC invites. It's a simple way to be able to hand an invitation to somebody and say, hey, I would love for you to come join me this uh, Christmas Eve. I was so proud of my uh, middle child, Lily, yesterday. She had, she didn't have one of the Christmas Eve invites with her, but she was walking her dog, and our neighbor's dog, and she came across somebody walking, and she's trying to work on her own social improvement skills, and she's 11 years old, and she just said, hey, uh, you want to come to Christmas Eve services at my church? And the guy, he was a Christian, he's like, you know, I've been, I've been trying to find a church. 11 year old. It's simple. Most people don't know, or we don't know who God is going to put in our path. But when he does, a simple invite could be that one invitation they need to come back in their God's house. And so I encourage you to take one of those out. So let us rise to the occasion with hearts full of conviction, hands ready to serve, and lives committed to demonstrating the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me, church. God, we are so humbled and honored again that we have this privilege of coming before you, Father, and just opening up your word and teaching us some real, I think, practical but hard truths, Father. Living faith in this world right now is challenging, Father, but it's not impossible. Father, we need to continue to work on being patient and persevering through any trial that may come our way. We know that you are our source of strength through Jesus Christ. We need to continue to commit to honesty, integrity in all of our dealings, no matter what the cost is, Father. You call us to be honorable and to represent you. And we need to actively engage you in prayer, Father, every circumstance, good or bad, Father, doesn't matter what it is, that we come to you first because you truly are the first love of our life. And Father, there are so many people in this church, uh, in your church, the big church, that have fallen away. And you have given us the tools that we need to be able to bring those souls back to you, Father. Father, you are a God that does not want to see any one of us perish, Father, but have the opportunity to hear the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we all may have that eternal life with you, Father. But it comes through your Son, Jesus. So, Father, we are grateful and honored and humbled. Speak with us, be with us, guide us. Allow us to not just be merely hearers, Father, but doers of your words today. And we humbly pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.